Hi there, and welcome back. How is everyone's writing going this week? Well, I hope. I can't believe that we are almost to the end of September already. I know we're not quite there yet, but wow. <laughs> I'm always very excited for the fall. I love the colors. I love when the weather starts to cool down. And of course, I love Halloween. As with all things commercial, they've had uh, the Halloween decorations and such out around, you know, in the stores around me since like the end of August. I know it was before September. And I was like, no, I mean, I love fall. I love Halloween. I'm excited to do some pumpkin baking. But uh, yeah, September is a little too early for me. So I'm excited for October to get here and really get into the swing of things. Um, and of course, we've had such a hot summer. It's, it's nice for things to cool down. Um, I don't think I have a whole lot in terms of the personal update. I'm still working on my same fiction projects, just plugging away at them, and they are going pretty well. All right. Why professional storytellers have such fanatical authority over their stories? And what does this even mean, right? <laughs> this is what I'm always trying to bring across to people, and it's difficult to explain in a way that is very intuitive. But the idea is that, of course, we all know what our story is about. We all have a pretty good idea who our character is and what drives them. But there's a difference between knowing that and having a really strong authoritative grip on it. What I mean is that you may not know your character as well as you think you do. Of course, they exist in your head, and you have kind of a neb nebulous idea of who they are and where they're going. But when you can actually write it down, when you can actually state it, you know, with a pen on a piece of paper or type it out or be able to really firmly articulate it, it makes a huge difference in how well you bring it across on the page, okay? That's why very often first-time writers have such vague writing, right? They, I mean, it's just a skill thing. They haven't learned to put in the details. They haven't learned the descriptions yet, and that's perfectly okay. It's just part of the journey of learning to write. But, but there's also a whole other level of things. You have to get to know your characters and your world really well. You have to be able to say at any given time what is driving them or else it's not going to come across well on the page. So let me try to illustrate this through a story. I love to bake and I've, you know, in my time watched a lot of baking competition type shows. I haven't watched as many in recent years since I started my business, but... Uh, one of my favorites is still The Great British Baking Show. Now, if you're at all familiar with the show, you know that there's always a challenge about midway through each episode where they, they do what they call the technical challenge. And the point of this challenge is that very often the bakers do not have a recipe and they do not have instructions. They just have ingredients and they have to figure it out. And so this is meant to test their baking skills and their innate knowledge of how to combine ingredients in a way that makes sense. So that's why they have to be pretty good at what they do because they don't have the recipe for it. So literally they'll have the ingredients and the instructions will just say, make the dough. <laughs> and it's like, um, okay, even experienced bakers know how to follow a recipe and how important that is. So that's really scary to just be given something like that and not know what to do with it. So I want you to think about if you were trying to make something, a recipe, let's say it's um, chocolate chip cookies, okay? You're given all the ingredients in front of you, but they're not necessarily measured out. They're just big bins, you know, of flour and um, sugar and butter and, you know, nothing's measured out. And then it just says, make the dough. <laughs> what would you do? I mean, even if they the ingredients were measured out, you very often have to combine things in the right order or else they don't combine correctly, right? Because there's always a chemical reaction between the different ingredients. So you have to combine, you know, ingredients A and B and then put C in. And if you were to mix them all together in the wrong order, you're just going to end up with mush because the wrong, you know, you didn't have the right chemical reactions in the right order. Um, so think about that for a minute. You have to make cookies and you're sitting there with all the ingredients and something that just says, make the dough. <laughs> I want you to think about what that would be like, how scary that would be, okay? And then contrast that with um, a recipe that has not only the amounts that you have, but the instructions. So they say, okay, so we're going to start by taking one stick of butter and one cup of white sugar and one half cup of brown sugar, and you're going to cream all of those together with your mixer until they're light and fluffy. Then you stop. Then you're going to add in one egg and mix together and then a teaspoon of vanilla and mix together. Then you're going to add all of the dry ingredients and here are the measurements for all of them and you can add them all at the same time, you know, so you've got flour and uh, baking soda and salt and any other dry ingredients that might be in that recipe and then mix them all together until the dough comes together and this is what it should look like. And then at the very end you add in any extras like oatmeal or chocolate chips or candy or whatever you're putting in it and with that you don't need to use the mixer, you can just use the spoon. You see what I mean? How there's 
so much difference in knowing exactly what to do, how much to put in, and even kind of how to do it and what it should look like at every step of the way. Obviously, that's way easier and it's less scary and you know exactly what to do and you're not guessing. It's not vague, right? Well, the same is true in your writing, okay? I don't want you to just have a pretty good idea of who your character is or what's going on in their head or how they're going to change by the end of the story, okay? I want you to have an ironclad authoritative grip on your story, okay? So that you know exactly what is happening at every moment, what it looks like, why it is happening, and what it's leading to. Why? Because that is how you bring a powerful story across on the page. I think I've said this before, but even when you have that strong authoritative grip on things, it doesn't always come across very strongly on the page. You have to practice on it. But now imagine you don't have that strong grip on it. It's not going to come across on the page hardly at all, right? So you have to understand that. It's always going to feel a little bit watered down to the reader as compared to what's in your head, which is why you have to have a very strong grip on what's happening and what you're trying to communicate to the reader, or it's just not going to come across. I'm actually going to take this a step further and talk about maybe knowing different kinds of cookies, all right? So once again, because I bake a lot, I know this. There are a lot of different types of cookies. The recipe that I just gave you is kind of a basic recipe for what's called a drop cookie, and chocolate chip cookies are one of that kind of cookie. These cookies are called drop cookies because you drop them by spoonfuls onto the pan to be baked. So the dough holds together well, but as soon as you mix it, you can just drop it onto the pan and bake it that way. But there are all kinds of cookie recipes out there, right? There are no-bake cookies that are actually done on the stovetop. There are what are called shaped cookies. What that means is you have to, you know, sound, what it sounds like, you have to shape them. So things like sugar cookies, snickerdoodles, chocolate crinkles, things like that. And there's a million other types of recipes. So in order to be a master cookie baker, <laughs> you not only need to know how to do a particular kind of recipe, but you need to know different types of recipes. What makes them different? What makes them work? And how to combine different types of ingredients so that you can say, okay, this is a drop cookie. This is what it should look like. And this is why. Versus this is a shaped cookie. This is what it should look like. And this is why. And how to do each one individually. Okay. The same thing is true of your writing. I want you to be a master storyteller. I want you to know all the different moving parts of a story, how to combine them in different ways for different genres and different tropes, and what makes it work for the reader, okay? If you can do that, you can do anything you want. You can write anything you want. You can genre hop whenever you want because you will always be telling a very cohesive, well-told story. And more to the point, guys, I am somebody who writes in several different genres, and most people tell you not to do this because, especially at first, it takes a lot longer to build your audience. And I will say that is true. Okay, I probably built my audience much more slowly because I was jumping from genre to genre. But here's the thing that I've learned. As long as you are telling a well-told story, readers will follow you anywhere, okay? So of course there are some people who only read my crime fiction and are not interested in my historical fiction because they don't read that and that's fine. But I have a very high number of crossover readers who will read anything that I wrote, even if it's not really their favorite genre, just because I wrote it and they like the way that I write, okay? And here's the thing, that's not tooting my own horn or trying to say I'm such an awesome writer, it's because of the type of story that I write. It's because I always write transformational stories, and I always give them a very emotional and cathartic experience. And as long as that's the case, they will follow me into other genres. So if you want to be able to do this, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, maybe you want to stick with one genre, that's totally fine. But the point is, you can become a master storyteller, and you can apply it to any genre, any story, any time. And that is what I want for you. So please don't think that this doesn't apply to you because I'm telling you, most people think they have an authoritative grip on their story and they really don't. It's just a matter of not knowing what we don't know and needing to learn and up-level our craft, okay? So I guess we need to define what constitutes having an authoritative grip on your story. How do you know whether you have one or not? Well, the elements of a strongly written story by somebody who is a master storyteller would be that they have a strong, detailed, and well-thought-out internal arc, okay? The events in the plot must force the character to deal with those internal issues. The internal beliefs need to drive how the character reacts to plot events. 
It needs to be a cohesive, self-contained story that feeds back on itself, much like a itself, much like an infinity sign. This is all stuff you've heard me say before, but it always comes back to these elements, guys. So if you cannot, at the drop of a hat, tell me what your character's internal arc is. I mean the entire journey and how they're going to transform during the story. If you cannot tell me what their misguided beliefs are and how those affect how they react to elements in the plot, and if you cannot tell me why exactly in a you know kind of chain reaction sort of way, the story ends the way it does, why everything comes to a head the way it does and the climactic point and why it turns out the way it does, then I'm telling you, you do not have enough of an authoritative grip on your story and you need to know it better in order to convey it to the reader more deeply. So let's give an example of this. I just want to illustrate the difference between these two examples that I'm going to give you, okay? So let's say I'm telling a story and I say, well, let's see, I know my story pretty well. Uh, my story is about a single woman, and she is very lonely because she, uh, you know, doesn't have a significant other. But there's this guy that she looks at a lot, and she just thinks he's cute and, and really likes him and kind of has this fantasy going about the two of them meeting and falling in love and being together. And then one day something happens, and um, she is able to uh, actually meet him, but he gets hurt and uh, falls into a coma. And then she gets to know his family, and while that is happening, she actually starts to develop feelings for his brother and ends up falling in love with him instead. Even after the guy wakes up, I mean, she, you know, the brother is kind of her soulmate, you know, even though it was the other brother that she was fantasizing about. <laughs> I'm sure you can probably figure out by now which, uh, which example I'm using here. Okay, so that was, it is an interesting story. It's a good premise and it's intriguing. If I heard somebody tell me that, I'd be like, yeah, that sounds great. That sounds like a really fun story. But we're also not getting a lot of detail and we're not getting a ton of emotion in that, okay? So contrast that with something more like this. Okay, so my character is a single woman and uh, we find out through the course of the story that she lost her father several years ago. Um, he was sick and you know he became kind of a research patient and because of that she had to drop out of college and you know basically spent all of her money and her savings and ever since then she's been kind of a recluse she lost her father she's afraid to go out and um, afraid to you know make romantic connections or a lot of different connections and she also plans trips that she doesn't take so she's kind of a dreamer but she's stuck in a rut and she doesn't really um know how to get out of it and to, you know, get out and live her life again. So there is this guy that she sees every day when she's working and she thinks he's really cute and she, um, you know, has fantasies about meeting him and falling in love and that he's going to be her Prince Charming. Then one day something happens where he's hurt and she is able to go out and sort of rescue him. Um, but she doesn't really meet him because he falls into a coma. Um, after that, she starts to meet his family and get to know uh, specifically his brother. And this really forces her to create human connection in a way that she hasn't in years since her father died. It allows her to be part of a family and that allows her to get to know this brother and she actually starts to develop feelings for him. So the story is really about not only her finding her soulmate, her true soulmate, not the one she thought was her soulmate or hoped was, but it was also about her learning to live her life, you know, to stop just being a dreamer. You know, even if she hadn't ended up with him, she was still going to get out of her little cubicle and start taking those vacations she was planning. And in the end, of course, um, she finds her soulmate and is able to, you know, make that connection and so that she's not lonely anymore. And they get married at the end and it's all good. It's a romantic comedy. Okay, so do you see the difference there? <laughs> it's not just that I gave you more detail. Of course, I gave you more detail. But it's that I talked about her internal arc and what is driving her as a character. And yes, of course it is that she's lonely and wants to find companionship, but there is a deeper story going on there, which is the reason she hasn't gone out and found companionship yet. This is what I'm talking about. And this is the kind of thing the audience doesn't always pick up on, right? I mean, they, they know it. And if you were to mention it, they'd be like, yeah, yeah, I remember that in the movie. But they don't think of the story in terms of the internal arc. They think about what happens in the plot. And that's perfectly okay. But as the author, if you want to have an authoritative grip on your story. If you want to be a professional author, if you want to become a master storyteller, these are the things you have to not only be aware of, but purposefully plan in your stories, okay? So why is it important to have this authoritative grip? I could go through a lot of reasons, <laughs> a lot of which you've heard me say before, so I don't need to beat them to death. But the biggest thing that I want to bring across to you here is that it's to serve your reader, okay? If you want to make a living on your royalties, then you need to always be thinking about your customer and how to serve them. And for us, that is our readers, okay? As I said before, if you don't do these things, 
your story is not gonna come across well on the page. It will be very vague. And overall, the story, I mean, it might work kinda sorta, but it's not gonna really land in a way that makes people go, wow, that was amazing. Let me tell you one more cooking story here that I just thought of. So when I was learning to cook, I was young. I was probably 10 or 12 when I started cooking. And I had always baked with my mom, so I had a good idea with, of how to do it. But when I was learning and kind of doing recipes on my own, let me tell you, I screwed them up a lot. <laughs> it seemed like I would do a different recipe every week. And like for probably a year or two, I was messing it up a good 50, 75% of the time. Okay. And that's just part of learning. That's how it goes. And I remember this one time, I, I believe I was making cookies and the mixture that, that I ended up with was very crumbly, okay? It was not cookie dough. It, something was definitely wrong because it was crumbly, uh, almost like, for you bakers out there, almost like biscuit dough before you put the water in. It was just, it was kind of wet, but it was just crumbly. It was not coming together. So my, uh, my mom came home and she was looking at it and she just started going over ingredients with me. She's like, okay, did you put the sugar in? Yes. Did you put the butter in? Yes. And she was going through them. And then she said, did you put the eggs in? And as soon as she said that, I knew that's what I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten the eggs. And, you know, now it seems like, oh my gosh, how could you forget the eggs? But, you know, I was like 12. So <laughs> um, I went and got some eggs from the fridge and put them in. And actually it kind of fixed it. I mean, it kind of worked and it came together, but I remember that the texture was not quite right. And again, it's because I didn't combine them in the right order. So the eggs provided moisture and it did bring the dough together, but it was, they were very cakey kind of cookies rather than being that chewy texture that we like in a cookie, right? Um, so that is a very much how your story will end up being if you don't combine all the parts in the right way, okay? Maybe it'll work out. Maybe you'll have some success with it and you'll get some readers who like the story, genuinely. So if that is enough for you, then cool, do that. But, um, you know, for me, <laughs> I, I come from a very large family. We had lots of kids running through the house and all their friends. So it didn't matter that the texture of the cookies was a little bit off. Trust me, they still got eaten, um, you know, but it was just not a work of art in terms of what we actually want a cookie to be. So it just depends on how high a price you put on telling a really well thought out, beautiful, transformative, cathartic story. If you don't have this authoritative grip on your story, it might still be okay. It will still be vaguely story-like, but do you want to kind of sort of tell a good story or do you want to be a master storyteller? That's what you need to ask yourself. Okay, so let's recap real fast. Not having a deep understanding and a very authoritative grip on your story is kind of like trying to make cookies without instructions, okay? It's going to be vague, you're gonna be throwing things together and hoping for the best. And at the end, it may be vaguely story-like, but it's not gonna be this wonderful work of art masterpiece that we really all want our books to be. Professional authors that have this authoritative grip on their story have strong, detailed, well thought out internal arcs. They create stories in which the events of the plot force the character to deal with their internal issues and the internal beliefs of the characters specifically drive how the character reacts to plot events, which in turn drives the plot. So they become very cohesive, self-contained stories that feed back on themselves, almost like an infinity sign. And you need to decide if that's the kind of story you want to write or not. It really is completely up to you. So in terms of action steps this week, what I would like you to do is just think about this and decide if you want to be a master storyteller. All right, so that is what I have for today. Everyone have a wonderful week of writing and a wonderful week of story crafting. And remember, there is always a market for awesome.